success. Jamie and I may have a disagreement. Yeah, you can't just say whatever you want about people just because you're rich. I have an absolute right to mock them on YouTube. He's up there buggy whipping like he's the boss. I am not your employer. You know, I'm tired of the negativity. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. You're nervous, you're a little bit uh, upset, you're riled up. Yeah, maybe you should rethink your defense of that, you fucking idiots. We're just going to get rid of you. All right. But dude. 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 Uh, you want to smoke this joint? Yes. <laughs> Do you feel like you are a dinosaur? <laughs> <laughs> That's some good shit. Exactly. I'm happy now. It's a win-win. It's a win-win-win. Oh, uh, hell yeah. Now listen to me. Two, three, four, five times. Eight, four, seven, nine, oh, six, five, oh, one, four, five, seven, two, thirty-eight. 56, 27, one half, five eighths, 3.9 billion. Wow. He's the ultimate math nerd, don't you see? Why don't you get a real job instead of spewing vitriol and hatred, you left wing limbaugh? Everybody's taking their dumb juice today. Come on, Sammy. Dance, dance, dance. Rand Paul. I had my first post coital scene with uh, a woman. I'm hoping to add more moves to my repertoire. All I have is the dip and the swirl. Fine, we can double dip. Yes, this is a perfect moment. No. Wait, what? You make under a million dollars a year. You're scum. You're nothing. Excuse me? Fuck you, you fucking liberal elite. I think you belong in jail. Thank you for saying that, Sam. You're a horrible, despicable person. All right, going to take a quick break. I want to take a moment to talk to some of the libertarians out there. Take whatever vehicle you want to drive to the library. <laughs> what you're talking about is jibber jabber. Classic. I'm feeling more chill already. Good. Donald Trump can kiss all of our asses. Hey, Sam. Hey, Andy. Are you guys ready to uh, do some evil? Hitler was such an idiot. You think I might be a Nazi? Agree. No. Death to America. You. Yes. Wow. Wow, that's weird. No way! Unbelievable. This guy's got a really good hook. Throw our hands up. <laughs> uh, wow. Uh, um, but damn, I gotta get off. No worries. Let's, let's, I want to just flesh this out a little bit. I mean, look, it's a free speech issue. If you don't like me... Hey, 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 shut up! Thank you for calling into the Majority Report. Sam will be with you. And we are back. Sam Cedar, Majority Report. It's the fun half, ladies and gentlemen. It's so fun, so casual. We're doing this without the internet. We're doing it without an audience. That's the way we roll. We don't, look, listen, I would have done this show in my closet for the past 10 years. It just so happened that uh, we had an internet connection and people started listening, but I would have done it anyways. We're done exactly the same way. I just I probably would have like shaved a little bit less. No, that's not true either. I probably would have shaved exactly the same amount. I, I probably would have been soft collar every day. That's the only difference it would have been if I had done this show in the closet uh, the, for those 10 years. But uh, instead, uh, the internet worked. And this, today it doesn't. But, but Monday, it's going to be much better. Uh, rejoining me is uh, Nomaki Konst of the Nomiki show. You can find it at patreon.com slash the Nomiki show. Also on YouTube, Nomiki Konst on uh, YouTube. Uh, also uh, joining us now via audio. So we don't want to break the internets more is uh, Jamie Peck of the Antifada and the Majority Report. Hi, Jamie. Are you there? Here I am. Can you, you hear me? Good. Oh, I thank you. I have this uh, home recording set up here. I have a microphone today, so I don't have to use my crappy phone. That sounds pretty good. And uh, Matt and Brendan are listening, uh, but uh, their voices are silenced. We're going to get to uh, film guy Matthew in in just moments. Uh, I'm going to bring him on. Uh, but we still had stuff to talk about uh, with the primary. We're in the fun half now. Um, let's talk a little bit about, uh, and I should just say one more note about the primary. It, you know, can't cancel. New York is just down ballot races too. 
right. like, you know, like, I mean, this, this is really important stuff. Oh, wait, 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 no, it's the presidential primary is a different day than the uh, other races that are primary. Are they completely? Totally different. June oh. 23rd is the congressional primary day. My understanding is they're going to push it. The, the idea is to push it to June 23rd. You know, maybe if Cuomo had listened to us when we asked for consolidated primaries, we wouldn't be in this situation, Andrew Cuomo. Well, I mean, you know, that would have made it far too easy to get people out to vote. And you don't want that if you're Andrew Cuomo. This is a, an incumbent protection racket. And the best way to do that is to ensure that very few people come out to vote, which is, I mean, frankly, it's why AOC was able to sort of um, uh, win because, you know, Crowley thought like, all I got to do is get 17,000 people out to vote. And all of a sudden, 25,000 show up and he loses. Yeah. Um, and I'm. No date. Okay. All right. But, but turning back to the uh, presidential uh, primary. So um, there were, there was an accusation um, that came out, I believe last April, a year ago, April, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, a woman, Tara Reed, she worked for Joe Biden um, as a staffer in 93, if I am not mistaken. And as of April of last year, the accusation was that he had inappropriately touched her. It was sort of like, you know, more or less uh, consistent with, you know, other things that people have said about Joe Biden. He's, you know, he get, gets in their space. Maybe he like decided to see how soft their hair was or weird stuff like that or smelling them. Um, and so uh, there was a story that came out uh, from The Intercept uh, earlier this week that said, apparently at the beginning of this year, I think it was at the beginning of this year, she went to um, the uh, the group now it escapes me. What is it? Um, what time's up, okay. which is, which was the sort of a, a group set up by um, a lot of people associated with Hollywood, I guess, to deal with the me too problem that exists in that industry and presumably all industries, right? It was a way of basically saying, uh, we have more resources as actors and within Hollywood than, let's say, you know, um, a woman working as a, um, uh, a, a maid at, the, at a hotel. And so, you know, the idea is that we're going to sort of try and um, provide support and services for those people. And Anita Dunn is, if I'm not mistaken, like the ED of that, the executive director. She's a managing director of SKD Knickerbocker, but she's also one of the founders. So like, okay. keep in mind, she's making a, it's not just like she's directing the thing. She's making a big chunk of the money from the cons one of the largest, most profitable consulting firms on the Democratic side, SKD. Um, they represent the Time's Up Legal Fund, which is where they're putting the money to, to defend people who've made accusations against powerful folks. So, Tara Reid- doesn't she work for the Biden campaign as well as she advised Harvey Weinstein, or am I thinking of a different lady? That's the same, Anita Dunn. Okay. okay. And, well, I mean, the Bernie Sanders ahead. protester on stage in the last. Uh, you cut out a little bit there. Oh, I said she's also the one who thought that uh, Bernie Sanders was a protester in last in the last debate, like he was acting like a protester on stage. That's weird. Yeah, um, mask but off. But um, the and, and she went, she was told, uh, we can't represent you because uh, I guess SDK, Nick, well, she works for the Biden campaign. And so they saw that as a conflict of interest and they decided to uh, to not help her out. Um, well, I think what they said actually was that um, it's political because Biden was running for president and therefore that could jeopardize their NGO status. Okay, so they uh, they rejected um, um, uh, representing her and uh, said it was because it would it would. It would but that's would, false. They're not going to lose their C three status if they represent a uh, you know a client who is making allegations against a sitting lawmaker. That's that's opposite. It's not especially for you know it's not like the organization has a political slant that's anti democratic and also who's going to you know, who's going to prosecute them? Trump's, you know. <laughs> right, right. Like, and it's also really hard to say that, you know, uh, Anita Dunn is, um, is you know, uh, set this thing up to attack Democratic candidates. Exactly. Um, but, uh, 
So uh, she was rejected uh, uh, by them. They decided not to represent her, which is, you know, I mean, it's it would be hard to come up with a scenario which more illustrates what that group os ostensibly is supposed to do. We're here to represent women who are in particular might be afraid to come out and might not have the resources because they're going against a powerful man. Right. I mean, like that, that like this is, I, I don't know if there's really any daylight at all, like the slightest crack between this scenario and the scenario that presumably they were set up to, to, to be. And, and, and they set themselves up after Weinstein's story broke. I mean, right. that's important. If, if this infrastructure were in place today and, and Weinstein's, the Weinstein story hadn't broken, and many of the, the Hollywood folks and the, the actors in, in this organization were the ones who came out with their stories about Weinstein. But if Anita Dunn were the consultant working with this firm and Weinstein came forward, would Anita Dunn say, no, 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 political because Harvey Weinstein hosts a lot of Democratic fundraisers. Right. Well, I, I hope not. Well, uh, <laughs> I'm, but, but uh, it certainly brings, you know, it, it, it raises some interesting questions. Um, and so um, uh, Tara Reid went on uh, Katie Halper's show uh, the other day and uh, uh, made new allegations, which uh, basically involve um, that Joe Biden essentially uh, penetrated her with his fingers and, um, it, you know, and uh, it was not welcome to do so. And uh, sexual assault. I mean, I think uh, I don't know, you know, specifically if that constitutes rape, but it sounds pretty darn close to it. Uh, if it doesn't in a, you know, the strict legal sense, but I think it is. Um, and, uh, then said something to the effect of like, you're, um, uh, you know, no one cares about you anyways. You're, you're not relevant. Um, as she, you know, attempted to get him off, uh, you know, off of her, that is the allegation. Um, and so, I mean, that's where we are, uh, right now. No one, I have not seen it reported by any major news outlet, but, but to be honest, I haven't been paying too much attention to, uh, major news. But it certainly doesn't seem to be garnering much attention outside of that intercept story about her attempt to, um, to uh, you know, to go to that uh, that organization and get representation. I mean, what uh, I don't know. What do you guys think about in terms of like, you know, how you go forward with something like this? Yeah. You know Go ahead, go ahead, Jamie. Well, it's not surprising to me that the mainstream media is refusing to cover this story because we already know that they are in the bag for the Democratic establishment and they believe that Biden will be the nominee and they don't want to hurt his chances. Um, I think there's good faith and bad faith reasons that they're doing this, but it is uh, bottom line, the wrong thing to do to silence a story like this from a victim of sexual assault. What do you think the good faith uh, reasons are? I mean, I'm trying to put myself in the mind of a lib, right? So maybe it's uh, not, I'm not the best person to imagine this, but like they're probably, these people think Biden's going to be the nominee no matter what. And, you know, even uh, a sexual assaulter Democrat is better than, uh, you know, a many times over sexual assaulter Republican. Well, it's why they can't, you know, it's so hypocritical that they fix their entire message to Trump's sexual assault as a turning point in what they thought was going to be a turning point in the election in 2016. And, and it backfired for many, many reasons. Um, but I think, you know, this is, it's just such apparent hypocrisy. And the right wing, of course, is highlighting it right now. I'm, I'm just doing a quick little Google search to see who's covered this. And it's, you know, it's picked up in the Washington Examiner, right by all the... So now, essentially, this is the whole shtick, right? They can now say it it, 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 we lose muscle in our argument when the right wing picks it up. And this has happened with a lot of different, you know, stories that have come out about Joe Biden, Hillary Clinton, a lot of Democratic lawmakers. If the left brings it up first and then the right wing picks up on it, for the most part, it just becomes a right wing talking point. And then we get attacked for using right wing talking points. 
even though it's a very legitimate claim. I mean, she, in this story, uh, it's been updated on, on The Intercept by Ryan Grimm, you know, it says in the piece that, uh, that she went forward to her brother, her mother, and a friend who worked in Senator Ted, Ted Kennedy's offices about, about the incident at the time in 1993. So, you know, there's, there's like some real stuff. Well, there's concurrent, I mean, the mother, uh, his, her mother is dead, yeah, is right. my understanding. Uh, but, and, and I don't know if, did, if Grimm at that point had, has he confirmed with those two people that they said that? Uh, but if so, you know, look, concurrent, concurrent reporting yeah. is, I mean, this rises to the level of sort of evidentiary for, you know, for, for, for full on prosecutions. Um, they, um, you know, this is, uh, you know, that, that is one of the things that prosecutors look at, like, did that person at the time, not 20 years later, you know, tell somebody, but at the time, did they tell people yeah. uh, about it? And if they did, that carries a significant amount of weight. Now, I haven't seen any statements from those two people yet. Said, maybe yeah, there's, there's an update here. It says that um, Reed's friend was asked to remain anonymous to not be part of the public pushback, but she said that she discouraged Reed from coming forward at all, concerned that she would be attacked and would never get an apology she was hoping for. Reed and her brother, uh, Colin Moulton, both said that their mother urged her to call the police, but her brother urged her to move on and said, quote, uh, I did not encourage her to follow up. I wasn't sure of her better advocates. I said, I wasn't one of her better advocates. I said, let, let it go, move on. Guys are idiots. He, Moulton now lives in Georgia, said he voted for Gary Johnson in 2016 and has no intention to vote for either Biden or Donald Trump. So, uh, you know, there's there's a little did, bit here. Did they address, were they addressing the the new allegations or the-, no, the at the time. So is, is I mean, from well, what we I- We don't know, we don't know which, I mean, because she's introduced more serious right. allegations yeah. and we don't know which one of those uh, they, they are. And- right. um, Oh, I thought that she told them at the time about this more serious thing. No, I, do, I yeah. don't know. That's, that, that's, that says in this piece at the, as the, at the update at the time she told her. So it says Reed has given an interview with podcast host Katie Halper describing her time in Biden's office. And she described a sexual assault in 1993. At the time, she told her mother, brother and friend she worked. OK, so that sounds like the allegations that she um, uh, said on, on Katie's show. Um, she did relate to those people. Uh, I mean, you know, this is the thing that I find uh, a, a little bit frustrating about this. And Nomi, are you, um, are you frozen? Snow be frozen? I think we sort of lost uh, Nomi there, but um, you know, what, from my perspective, the, um, oh, there she's back. I mean, look, this is, you know, the, the idea that, um, that, that people are bringing this up, uh, you know, and any critique of, of Joe Biden at this point is perceived as doing uh, the right wing's uh, work. But I mean, the reality is that this is very difficult, I think, for the right wing to make operative. And if, um, you know, if, if um, the, uh, you know, constituents uh, on the, the, you know, uh, if Democratic constituents don't care about this, um, it's not something that the right is going to be able to, uh, to, uh, operationalize, uh, in the same way that I think that like, you know, they could for, uh, corruption or not. It just shows a tremendous amount of hypocrisy by all these organizations that would presumably be far more interested in this. If, you know, uh, this was, I don't know, Mitt Romney or, 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 or Donald Trump for that matter. Now, uh, Donald Trump has paid, as far as I can tell, zero price uh, for the 20 some odd allegations, including a rape allegation of, uh, you know, on his part. But that, I, I, you know, I don't know why that seems to be relevant. Um, well, know. I mean, you want to look back in history. We had prominent feminists making excuses for Bill Clinton, despite his many, many allegations of sexual harassment and full on rape. So it really doesn't surprise me that members of the Democratic establishment would be showing their asses again and sh demonstrating that their interest in feminism is hollow and opportunistic. I want to hear what Kristen Gillibrand has to say about this one. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, it is, you know, the thing is, is that um, and, and, and to the extent that anybody had any 
excuses then, which I don't think they did, but I mean, but you know, there is a doctrinally now, uh, a lot of people have, you know, uh, have basically, um, pronounced that, um, it is necessary, uh, to believe the victim at the very least, uh, enough to really investigate it. Right. And, yeah. you know, I don't think that you, um, I don't, I don't interpret that. And I don't think people should is like automatically uh, assume that the person did it, but you should investigate these claims enough to be able to, you know, sort of say like, we've investigated it. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, that would mean go and talk to those people who, um, who, who, you know, the brother go and talk to the friend. I mean, there should be someone else who's, you know, there's, there's some of these organizations should be doing this. And I, and, um, you know, well, why would they do that when they could convince all of their MS NBC brain viewers that this is just a Russian op? Yeah. Well, I mean, if they can, then I guess that's, that, that, that's why they wouldn't. But, um, but I, I, I mean, I, it's, you know, and I understand people saying like, you know, uh, Donald Trump is, um, you know, we need to get rid of Donald Trump. I agree. But, um, you know, you're going to eliminate like, uh, the, a, a huge swath of the reason why people have a problem with Donald Trump. I think you're, you're on, you're in sort of like weak, weak ground. He uh, has a real, Biden has to pull in two constituencies that he has done absolutely nothing to pull in at this point. And one is of course, pro- progressives or basically people under 50, and the other is women. I mean, there's been, uh, I was at a meeting, I ate, it, um, well, I think, uh, I think I know where she was going with this. Um, look, if they think that this is not going to become an issue in the general election, if they think Trump's not going to go there, they've got another thing coming. Trump, as we've said on this show many times in the past, does not need to show that he's morally superior to Biden. He just needs to show that Biden is just as bad as he is and a hypocrite to boot, right? He needs to drag him down in the mud with him, which will be very easy to do considering that he has a very credible Uh, accusation of sexual assault against him. I mean, Biden is running on his character, right? And on restoring, quote unquote, decency to the office of the presidency. And I think he's very vulnerable on that. It's going to depress turnout for sure, especially among women, like Nomiki was just starting to say. Yeah, I mean, I I don't know uh, for sure. I mean, there's been an ability, it seems to me, to ignore all of this uh, with Biden. Um. You know, you don't have to be to the left of Biden to um, to make an assessment that he is a liability in the general election on some level. And, you know, I don't know, maybe. Um, I don't know. But uh, yeah. Nomi just texted me. She said our brand new Internet just went out completely. I have no idea what's going on. I don't know. I might be in the area. Uh, so. OK, wow. Well- the internet's breaking, but, um, uh, all right. Well, I mean, that's, I, you know, I don't know what else there is really ultimately to say. I mean, obviously that the, 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 there needs to be, you know, I would, I am, I'm sort of surprised that we're not seeing any, well, maybe I shouldn't be, but, uh, any institutions out there taking this allegation seriously enough in which to, at the very least investigate it and, you know, sit down with the, uh, Tara Reed and, you know, see if uh, the story is is credible. I mean, well, uh, I think it goes back to what we've been talking about all along about how what's happening in this primary shows the fundamental lack of independent working class institutions that people trust in this country. Right. That's why we're seeing a lot of the results that we're seeing. And I think it's becoming more apparent than ever that the media at large, you know, not counting alternative media like ourselves, is fully captured by the Democratic establishment. Um, I, I, yeah, I mean, there's, I, I, I don't know how else you can explain the, um, I mean, I, I don't know about the, it, it, the, you know, the, the, the lack of a working class um, of movement 
is relevant in this instance. I mean, if Cory Booker was the only person left in the, uh, the campaign, um, I think you'd still have the problem, same problem. Um, and, uh, but certainly the, the media has a reluctance. Uh, the mainstream media has a reluctance to, um, go after Biden on this now. Uh, you know, part of my concern is that it's quite possible that they're going to find their conscience, uh, in September. And that would be more consistent with what we've seen from the media. Right. I mean, that is, um, you know, we, we saw that in the context of Hillary's emails, right? I mean, right. Uh, of all the things to critique uh, Clinton on, it was the emails that dominated and it was the least relevant of any of it. Um, and so, I, you know, I don't know if it is, uh, I, I think at this juncture, they are hesitant to go after uh, him on this, but I'm not convinced. And frankly, that's what my, you know, from from a from a losing to Donald Trump perspective, right? I mean, putting aside the 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 hypocrisy and the the idea that this should be, um, all right, here's Nomi back. Um, putting aside, no, I think Trump's going to make. It let me into finish. A story, sorry. Well, Trump Trump can make it into a story, but um, my concern is that, um, and, and Trump can you know there can be Facebook ads targeting uh, people. You know, putting aside, of course, like, you know, the failure and the, the hypocrisy of, of these institutions to address this, it's also quite possible that this media that is not bringing it up now is going to be more than happy to bring it up in, uh, in September and in, uh, in, in October. Um, I mean, it's out there. They're all aware of it now. Yeah. And, you know, Donald Trump is not, um, nobody thinks that Donald Trump, uh, Trump is a, uh, a credible messenger, but you know, like you say, you could make an issue of it and then they're going to start to talk about it. Absolutely. And, you know, half of the states haven't voted yet in the primary. Right. This seems like the kind of thing that people would or should want to consider um, when choosing a candidate to go up against Trump. Um, I but I you know, I I I. I, I mean, I maybe I'm just cynical and, and know me. You can weigh in on this, too, if you, if you can hear us. Uh, I can hear you. Um, you know, some of the biggest critics of Joe Biden have come from some of the uh, loudest feminist voices. Um, you know, uh, you know, Rebecca Traister, for instance, yeah. has been, you know, came out with one of the earliest and I think one of the most comprehensive critiques of Biden in this way mm -hmm. and more or less ignored. Yeah. You know, we've, you know, the way well before the, 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 the voting, you know, like more or less ignored, ignored by all the same people that we're talking about are ignoring this now. I think well, it's a conscious decision. And this is, this might be a, a little controversial to say, but I think they're making a conscious decision to trade in the white working class man for the feminist or, or vice versa, the feminist for the white working class man. And it was essentially, it's, it's the opposite strategy of Hillary Clinton. I don't think it needs to be either or. I think you have to have both, just like Bernie needs to have, you know, young woke millennials and, you know, factory workers uh, in, in the Rust Belt. You need to have both. And that's ultimately the problem the Democratic Party has. They don't know how to balance these, these all working people. They're very good at, you know, having mixes of them and the professional class, but they're not very good at understanding uh, diverse working class, you know, multi-generational a voting block. And, you know, Joe Biden, I think, I think, you know, there, there is some truth that there, the Rust Belt voters may not connect with, you know, extreme feminist language that, you know, we believe in. You have to be able to speak their language and say, well, would you want your I, wife treated this way if they want well, to? Well, I think that it's very likely that there are some, uh, you know, advisors to Joe Biden. I don't know if they're saying it to Joe Biden's face, but uh, when they're sitting around the table, they're going like, you know, for every, uh, you know, uh, Rebecca Traster and uh, Nomi Key Const and uh, Jamie Peck we lose, we're going to pick up four guys, you know, yeah. who are, um, you know, uh, uh, working, um, I don't know, working construction in, in, in Wisconsin. Well, they honestly, give they might be right about that. Like we saw with the utter failure of the Warren campaign, there just aren't that many of those people out there. Like I was actually surprised. I 
I had a certain stereotype in my mind of the professional class, probably because of being raised with so many, you know, nice, well-intentioned left liberals who sincerely care about feminism, even if I think their analysis is a little incomplete. Um, but like most of the people in that income bracket don't really care that much about feminism. They don't really care about progressivism. They're going to vote for Joe Biden. Before I was like, well, no, I don't think these professional class people are going to jump in a coalition with working class Democratic voters because they find Biden embarrassing, distasteful, anti-feminist, all that. I think what the failure of the Warren campaign has showed that is that these people are not as substantial a voting bloc as we thought they were. I don't know about that. I think what it is is I think that they're feminists, but they're not feminists first. They vote with their pocketbook just like everybody else does, just like the factory worker does, just like, you know, we do. Rebecca Traster makes her money making the feminist case. Now, you know, she believes in it just like we make our money making the progressive case. But if they're if they're working on Wall Street, you know, they're not going to vote against their pocketbook because the alternative is 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 Bernie Sanders. I mean, Rebecca Tracer was basically at the point where she was ready to vote for Bernie Sanders, which is like, you know, mind blowing. I, I don't, I'm not as surprised by that, but uh, because I, I mean, I think like uh, I think Bernie Sanders is always her number two. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, that, I that think... surprised me, but 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 the the point remains. I mean, the you know that there. I, I think you're right. I think there's just not. Um, you know, I am. Um, I my contention has always been that misogyny is much easier. Uh, you know, people are much more comfortable with with casual misogyny in this country than just about any other type of discrimination. Absolutely, broadly but also, speaking. But but we have to understand, like, they people might care about this issue in the Democratic primary base. That's not all of America, but not. It's not their number one issue. See what I'm saying? I mean, that, that's the problem with gun control. Yes. You know, and to, I mean, you know, everybody's like, oh, uh, you know, you can get 60, 70 percent, 80 percent. I'm for responsible gun control. Uh, how often do you vote on that? Well, that's actually the sixth thing that uh, comes into play when I cast my vote. And if there's, you know, any any of one through five will override that one. Hmm. And that's and that's, you know, that is the, you know, the, p- people forget they, there's, they'll look at the poll. I mean, this primary is a perfect example of it. 65% of the people uh, decided to vote not based upon agreement on the issues. It was just uh, voting on who they thought or they had, you know, uh, been told can beat Donald Trump. And, uh, and so, you know, the primary is a perfect example of that. Like I'm willing to put, you know, and I, I'm not convinced that that isn't, you know, there's look, there's no way, to ever prove that allegation, right? There's just no way. And it is, um, it's certainly, you know, there's, I haven't heard any other allegations that are that serious, but it's not inconsistent with, at, at the very least, Joe Biden being somebody who sort of felt like, you know, there's no difference between my space and uh, other women and women's bodies. <laughs> you know, like I, I that that I I can if I, my face lands in their hair, that's what I want to do. Um, you know, I I you know so, uh, but there's no you're never going to get conclusive uh, evidence or or proof of it, and uh, yeah. so I think it becomes easy for people to just say like. I think we also have to keep in mind that when these stories come up, it it is far more likely that a Democratic lawmaker, if it's given, if story is given oxygen, is to be canceled than a Republican lawmaker. You've seen countless numbers of Republican lawmakers just Al Franken. Al Franken in a minute. uh, I mean, rightfully so, Schneiderman. uh, But but they they suspend their campaigns. They step down immediately. Whereas Republicans, it really, you know, it's hit or miss. You've got outrageous allegations against multiple Republicans in office right now across the country, but because they just, their base doesn't care as much about these issues, you know, believe them. They don't believe the mainstream press. I mean, part of it is just this ecosystem of of how the press works with each voting population. And if the Washington Post is not covering this, then it's not an issue for Democratic voters. Yeah. 
I mean, I'm not feeling terribly optimistic about this in terms of the Democratic Party's response. I think they've already shown that they're willing to bet all of their chips on somebody that they already know has serious issues. So right. I, I'm not really sure what could happen that would change that at this point. All right. Well, um, I'm going to uh, bring on uh, Matthew Film Guy so we get some uh, film recommendations. Uh, now, McKee, folks, you can find her show. And now, look at, she's completely set up. Uh, head to patreon.com slash the no McKee show uh, or uh, youtube.com no Mickey const um, and uh, check out their show. Uh, Nomi, thanks so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it was fun. Really fun. All right. And so, um, Matt, uh, I'm going to take a, a brief moment. I'll call uh, Matthew Film Guy and um, there's not going to be a problem calling him. Is there or, or should we try and send him a, a link to Zoom? All right, I will. I will try and do that right now. Um, do I just jump off? OK, yeah, you just <laughs> okay. jump off. Can, just press, OK, bye. Uh, he can't call in, right? Uh, we got to do a link. I hope he's got the thing. All right. Well, I'll, I'll uh, give us a break, and then I will. Uh, I'll send it to him. We are back, Sam Cedar, on the Majority Report. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the time of the show where I say something that you think is going in one direction. You don't understand what I'm talking about. And really what it is is a way for me to do a roundabout cue for Matt to play the Matthew Film Guy song. And unfortunately... Um, you know, while we were, it, it, uh, the Matthew film guy song was not in our go bag when we, uh, when we left the office. And, uh, so we need to track that down. So I'm just going to say, you know, do the, the last line is Matthew film guy, Matthew film, film guy. guy. Hey, Sam, how you doing? Uh, I'm, I'm fine. How are you doing? You are in, uh, you're in, uh, you're, you're sheltered at home in Queens. Yes, I am in my usual sheltering in place location, which is my home office. So I can't say that the quarantine is that different than my normal existence, except for the complete collapse of everything outside of here. Right. So, um, and now are you guys stepping outside to get some air? What are you doing? You, um, Matt. I've been walking my dogs, Dudley and Mabel. Uh, you know, Mary and I have two cute little fuzzy dogs, and they still need to go outside and walk around and pee on stuff and do their business. Of course. So uh, I've been managing to do that. But, you know, people are on the street being fairly respectful, giving a wide berth. Um, so I think I'm probably not putting myself at too much mortal risk doing that. But uh, these days, I don't know. And how know. are you getting but, food? Uh, what are you doing? For, what are you doing for food? Uh, we stocked up big time. Uh, you know, we we've been dipping into the takeout thing, a little civic duty, a little laziness with preparation. Um, I feel like you got to load up on takeout now before things really fall apart and then keep the food that can stay in the freezer and the cupboard. So we're doing a little little bit of mix of that, although I think we've 
transitioned more completely to preparing our own food at this point. I did an Instacart, had one guy come and drop off some food, you know, kind of did the quarantine protocols on the food that way. But uh, it's, uh, you know, it's been a, it's been an adapting process. I've had to learn the value of lotion, not just washing your hands, but lotion, because uh, I've washed them so hard that they've started to like crack. So, uh, you know, okay. it's a learning curve. I understand. Um, well, I'm sorry to hear about your, your hands. Well, and in many respects, um, uh, uh, the, this time, this moment is, is really, is really yours to shine, at least in the context of the show. This was, um, uh, in many respects, this, this segment was developed, uh, based upon the, uh, the premise that over the weekend I'd need some streamed um, uh, videos to watch. And back at a time where we had to like, you know, where streaming was still in 2010, when we started this or 2011 or 12, whenever it was that you, we started having you on, like it was, it was a unique thing, right? Like you could stream something. And uh, now of course, this is the way that everybody gets their uh, entertainment for the most part. And, um, it, 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 you are in high demand. I mean, people aren't just looking for one movie from Matthew Film Guy. They're looking for a whole uh, mess of it. And I also, I should also, oh, well, uh, I'll get there. But uh, so, I mean, do you feel any type of pressure? Oh, definitely. I mean, this is uh, this is go time for, for a film guy. Uh, what you got in the chamber, you know, everyone's got their uh, favorites. And uh, it's really, you know, you also have to walk a line. Like, do you want, to take this moment to kind of reflect and spend time on a movie that's a little more difficult that you may not have felt like you had the space in your life to really give attention to that it requires a foreign film and art film or at this point where you're underneath a stressful pandemic do you just want to veg out and watch something that could actually just take your mind off of what's going on uh, i've actually vacillated between the two extremes i've been watching some of those more difficult movies but then like when it gets really bad i've been watching like freaking Hulu reruns of Knight Rider. So like, I don't think it gets much lower than that. What? Um, so you really have to Wait, know Knight what Rider? your mood and moment is. Knight Rider? Is that with Kit? Is that <laughs> yeah. the one with the, the talking the car? The show with the talking car, Sam. That's how bad things are getting here. The show with the talking car. Wow, man. That, that show is, I mean, that show is bad. It's terrible. And it's, but it's hilarious because you get to watch some sort of like 80s kind of uh, dynamics with television production and, you know, I liked it when I was, I was like eight when that show came out. So uh, it really had, uh, it, it gave me exactly what I needed, just something completely mindless and escapist. Um, but at the same time, you know, there's also the, the, the sort of a trend is like, give me your outbreak movies, give me your disease movies. So we've delved into a little bit of that, Mary and I, uh, we've gone down that sort of road. Although now it's getting to the point where those, I don't know if we can even enjoy those in the same sort of ironic way as it's getting sort of closer and closer here in Queens. But yeah. uh, there's some of those uh, on tap. Is there, so is there any films that have captured sort of this dynamic? I mean, not really. Right. But I mean, this is like, I, I feel like this is. Well, this... the, the, the big one is contagion by uh, Soderbergh that, that one people have been talking about a lot. And I've seen that years ago with uh, Gwyneth Paltrow and it really shows the sort of connectivity between the way things are spread and so on. It is, it is harrowing. It is definitely not uh, a light, uh, distracting entertainment uh, for, for times like this. But, you know, there's other ones like we, Mary and I watched uh, Outbreak with uh, Dustin Hoffman and Cuba Gooding Jr. and Morgan Freeman. I don't know if you recall that from the mid-90s. Exactly. That one's a little more mindless. It's Wolfgang Peterson, and it basically ends with a helicopter action chase. So... It's not quite as, as deadly, but it has some quotable moments. Did we like survive? And Hoffman says, it's airborne. So you can enjoy that with some distance. Uh, actually, uh, if you want to get right to one of the ones that I'm seriously recommending here, um, I think the uh, 1950 film starring Richard Widmark, it's sort of a crime gangster movie on the back of a doctor trying to stop a pandemic called Panic in the Streets. Have you ever heard of that one? No. That one's actually enjoyable because it's got enough sort of disease touchstones where you see Richard Widmark as like the very um, sort of um, intelligent, competent public health official doing what we would hope somebody would be doing right now, trying to track down the killers of this person who they discover has 
plague, basically. So they need to find the. It's a twist on a sort of film noir kind of crime gangster movie where they have to find the killer, not just to capture him, but because he's possibly spreading this disease. And uh, it's you know it's got a great cast of bad guys. Jack Palance as Zero Mostel as a bad guy. Really. Um, and it's not too heavy, but it still has that feeling of like, oh, this has happened before. People are aware of this kind of thing, so it gives you the kind of feeling of like, okay, this isn't brand new uh, for the world. And uh, meanwhile, it's you know, a gangster movie, so you can kind of veg out a little bit. Uh, I like that one. That sounds interesting to me. Now, I have to say, I, I have even less time than I normally have had. Right. Yeah, I mean, you got to fix your internet. I understand. I'm doing the show. I'm trying to set it up. And then I've got the kids now, you know, uh, for the part of the day that I'm not working. And then obviously into the night. Um so I don't, you know, I'm not promising anything. That's all I'm saying. But I mean, other no, I people. And I, this is more for the audience. I understand that you take these recommendations, you kind of file them away, and then you just ignore them. But yeah, the fine. only thing I have time to. We want you on that wall. We need you doing what you're doing. Don't waste any of your time relaxing, okay? We need you. The only time I, uh, I, I carve out any time is uh, for, you know, to watch uh, Survivor. And I'm, I'm weeks behind. Yeah, I mean, if you if you didn't watch that, how would you make a metaphor about almost anything on the show? That's right. I mean, it is stunning how many. Yeah, how, you how, need that. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm and, and so in a way, I'm working even when I watch that show. That's right. That's right. It's definitely part of the business. Uh, uh, what What else you got? Because one is not going to do it for a lot of people. They're at home. No, I I got a bunch. Okay. Uh, okay. You know, I also watched. You know, I don't. Have you ever seen the film Going in Style? It's a Carl Reiner movie from the late 70s. I don't think so. I think you would like this. Um, actually, no, I'm sorry. It was directed by Marty Brest. But it's uh, George Burns, Art Carney, and Lee Strasberg playing three senior citizens who decide like rob at the end of their lives that they're bored with their retirement to go rob a bank. And I, I, I'm, I'm quite sure I saw that. Because there, there was a period of time where like George Burns had this resurgence. And like, uh, like where like the Sunshine Boys... I mean, that's, uh, I, yeah. I, I, that was I, a little earlier in the seventies, but yeah. Uh, yeah. and the, um, there was a couple of those, like where like, you know, old, really old guys, uh, going out yeah, and doing exactly. stuff. And Art, Art Carney, you know, from the honeymooners, like yeah. his, probably, I think his last role. And, uh, you know, that's one of the ones that's like been on my list for years. I have some moments to clean it up. Turns out it was actually shot not too far from here in Astoria. So that was kind of nice to see the old neighborhood in the seventies. Uh, that's a great one. That's a, it's actually a very touching movie, even though it is sort of like, again, sort of like a, a gangster comedy. I feel like that's one I could watch comedy. with the kids. You could probably watch it with the kids. Yeah, I think so. I watched, um, <laughs> oh, I did that joke the other day and I thought it was last. Uh, I actually laughed at your last tango joke. I just, you know, to, other people, other people thing. told I, me that they, they did too. I mean, that is, I mean, it's not so much like it, it's not, it's not uh it's not so much about the reference it's about the nature of the film right exactly like, exactly right. You, the I butter could, scene and so on i could use nine and a half weeks that too would have been also like kid. something like that that would have been also inappropriate to watch with Saul. yeah um, definitely unless jim carrey was in it but go ahead um um i also want to say like if you're really looking to delve into the art film side of things as i have uh, another filmmaker i've been inspired to delve into is this japanese filmmaker Hirokazu Koreeda. I may have mentioned him in the past. I feel like you have. Uh, I, sh I showed his film Afterlife to my senior citizens class, which, by the way, is also now moving to a distance learning model. So I'm trying to get a bunch of senior citizens up to speed on Zoom. And uh, it sort of went well. We had like five or six people manage to do it out of like 20. Um, but we're, we're hoping to ramp that up. So I feel like that's... going to be able to be teaching that class. I feel like you could teach a second class on just getting on Zoom. And then... Yeah. Yeah, you, I basically have. I'm writing like a tutorial to try to get them to do it. And like, here's the equipment you can get if you don't have this. But the good news is it may open up the class to just more than just old retirees. So uh, we may wind up uh, having many, many more people on there. And uh, if if uh, the, the opportunity presents itself, maybe I'll forward you the information for that. So anybody could sign up for this class. Oh, that's exciting. Maybe you've uh, you found I mean. I, there's going to be a lot of like new, uh, new businesses, new ventures that, are, that come from this. 
Yeah, and I mean, and I'm gonna need it. I mean, I you know, I just got an agent for editing after Sundance, just in time for the world to collapse. So like that was like good news, bad news. So uh, yeah, there's gonna have to be some sort of uh, uh, creative thinking going on here. Although some of my corporate clients are still keeping me uh, employed, but uh, yeah, you don't know what's coming around the corner. So maybe it's distance learning of film classes. Who knows? I gotta say, you getting a, an agent as an editor coming off a of Sundance. And then this happening makes me feel like you took all the wrong lessons from my career. <laughs> and I have done my best to pattern myself after your career. So yeah. this is really a bad time to tell me that. Yeah. But uh, maybe so. Maybe so. I don't know. We'll see. I mean, I do hope the world comes back online, not just for my own personal film career, but um, that's on the list of reasons. Okay. Uh, you know, T Ted Alexandro's podcast is still going. In fact, we've upped it to two times a week. So if you want to check out a little bit me with Ted, he's, you know, he's changed from being a stand up comedian to a stay at home comedian. Those guys are really devastated. They can't actually tell That's jokes true. in public anymore. So everyone's on Instagram or, you know, online, basically. Making social media just a little bit more funny. A little bit. Mm. It's arguable. But yeah. And, you know, and Ted does things like covers like the actual situation the pandemic he's always got that political bent so uh i think people like checking out a little bit me with him uh you know and actually i found out things just from mary mary and her friends are playing like these online games like now with zoom and everything it's like i think people are hanging out actually more at least in new york spending more time with each other now that it's like oh we can all do this and you know hang up whenever we want walk away from it whenever we want so it, it may actually wind up that people are interacting more under this quarantine than they did when they had the opportunity to actually go somewhere. Well, I think more people have more time and you start to think yeah. about, you know, also start to prioritize, you know, what's important uh, in, 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 in your life. And that is like, I think connections with other people. Yeah. And that's why I'm on season three of Knight Rider. Right. Which is about a guy and his talking car. <laughs> it also jumps, you know, it jumps over stuff. Every episode, it jumps over something. The car. Oh yeah, Turbo Boost. I gotta uh, be honest with you. I never time, watched yeah, an entire cool. episode of that. Call. I mean, I've watched a lot of junky television in my life. That is not one that. I mean, that's beyond junky. That's, oh yeah, what's it's sub junk? Uh, it's great keep... when David Hasselhoff actually sings too. Oh my God, it's it's unbelievably great and horrible. Wait, Jamie. But yeah, you don't have to pay attention too close to it. Jamie, what what did you say? I was just gonna say you guys keep saying this show is bad, but it sounds awesome. It is. It's, but it's both. So it's really hard to say which is. It's like it's Schrodinger's cat. It's, it's amazingly cool and terrible at the same time. I, you know, I loved it when I was five. Like that was like the draw. And now you see it, and you're like, oh my god, this is. I think the problem. So weird. I think the problem for me is that it came out when I was probably like twenty, right? Uh, or yeah. fifteen. Yeah. And I'm like, you're, yeah, you were twenty. This is you're, dumb. Was, like you right. know, Herbie the Love Bug was more interesting. <laughs> Yeah, I, mean, I think Kit and Herbie the Love Bug would probably be buddies if I had to really put it to it. I just, uh, I also, I think I found Hasselhoff to be like, who cares about that dude? Yeah, and he is terrible. He is really, it's really amazing worst. to watch the cheesy 80s acting. Uh, Edward Mulhair as uh, as Devin is sort of like his handler. He's he's actually a classy actor. He You, you get some uh, uh, inspiration uh, that he could actually, uh, you know, cash those checks, but uh Anyway, it's it's like it's like a time machine. It's like what did people think was worthy of the eighties were horrible. In the eighties were horrible, just in everything. It seems to me. Yeah, but, um, yeah pretty much. All right, do we uh, have one? It's, you know, also the quarantine has allowed me to listen to all kinds of new music too. So I, I know I'm the film guy, but Bandcamp uh, is starting to offer a greater cut of the profits to the artists in this time. So like I bought a whole ton of music that I just been sort of hoping to see or listen to. Um, Wait, is so this your way for covering that you only have three films? Oh, no, I got more. You want more films? Yeah, give me one more film. Four films. Okay, well, um, I did... First of all, everyone should be following me on Letterboxd uh, at Letterbox with no E, uh, you know, B-O-X-D slash Langdon Boom. That's uh, Matthew the Film Guy's Letterbox. Um, and you can see, like, all the movies that I'm watching, all the movies I've uh, recommended for this. I also watched, I watched another, oh my God, this one I've been meaning to watch for so long and now I realize why I didn't. But like, do you realize that Candid Camera made a documentary, like an R-rated documentary in 1970 called What Do You Say to a Naked Lady? No. Have you ever heard of this? No. You need to see this. It is horrifying. I mean, it is, 
it, it's incredible. It's disgusting. It's like basically like I can't I can't describe what's worse about it that Alan Funt is actually like some sort of serious sexual pervert or like that he's interviewing these people in the 70s. It's like it's like an anthropological look at what was actually happening in the 70s, both on purpose because he's asking questions about like sex and morality, but also by accident because the way he's talking about it is so like um, unself aware, at least, you know, 40, 50 years later. Right. Um, but that's that's a weird one to put on your list. But it's highly disturbing in its misogyny and just casual sort of sexism. Oh, great. Um, yes. Well, let's definitely promote that movie on. Uh... Well, but it's as a histor as a historical view of the morality and the and the mores of that time. I think it's extremely important. Um, OK, let's see. We also you know, I, I saw another movie that I, this is one that I can't say I recommend that highly. But um, well, that's what you're shape- doing here. You're recommending movies. You're not talking about movies oh, okay. that you've seen that are bad. Okay. What? Okay, well, that here's one I can sense. recommend. Fat City, one of the last movies by John Huston, made in 1972 about a sort of washed-up alcoholic boxer played by uh, Stacey Keach, and it stars Jeff Bridges uh, as his co-star, and Nicholas Colasanto, who was coach on Cheers. You'd remember him from that. Of course. Uh, it's just a great 70s slice-of-life kind of, uh, you know, based on a novel, so it kind of has that novelistic kind of uh, structure to it. And uh, it's just like a really great movie with really great behavior. You know, these days, every movie is so plot oriented. You're just moving from thing to thing. Uh, But this movie really has real human behavior, a lot of squabbles and that kind of like noisy 70s style. Reaching into your inner Ray Carney. (laughs) What's that? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Ray Carney, of course, is the... uh... It is one of those heyday of the 70s movies but it's by john houston who did like you know treasure there's the right. madre and he did some very iconic uh more like hero's journey movies and this one is more you're saying is a little bit more is a little smaller and more about relationships yeah and towards the end of his career he he did that he did that kind of thing which is kind of interesting to to see a guy like that who you know kept kept changing kept growing uh even throughout his uh you know golden years shall we say you yeah. know when he did stuff like the african queen and asphalt jungle but then he wound up doing uh you know wise blood is another one i may have mentioned that before 70s, 70s quirky 70s movies that um definitely could have been you know he was a generation older than spielberg and and de palma and scorsese and right. these guys but he was still doing this kind of stuff and we should say uh, ray carney of course is the um uh was your film professor at bu uh, well, no, he wasn't actually my professor. I I wasn't? didn't go to BU. I went to Florida State. I just got in touch with him because I read his book on John Cassavetes, and it uh, just blew my mind when I was 19, and we struck up sort of a correspondence, uh, right. okay. and it went from there. That's how I met you. Yeah, short yes. story long. Uh, exactly. Uh, 20 years ago, I Ray was uh, a fan of uh, Who's the Caboose, and I- Which I've heard that's very good, too. That is good. That is also available uh, on, like- um, Amazon or iTunes, you know, the, 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 the fun thing for folks to do is to go and uh, watch just to give it, get a sense of like how bad at this I am. Um, Go and watch the, the trailer for who's the caboose. It doesn't involve any of who's the caboose. It involves actually uh, Dorsey um, who is uh, uh, back with us uh, at the beginning of this show, I sat in an office and before we even set up anything for the show, I did the trailer for who's the caboose. And it is, you know, I watch it now. And I, at the time, you know, I, I, I would, I would get into my head a little bit and was like, I don't care how it is for marketing. I just want to create something with everything I put out. And it is the worst marketing device and, and, and if folks don't aren't familiar with the movie business, a trailer is supposed to be something that gets you to watch the movie. And I did not appreciate that element of it. And the trailer is, I, I don't, I, I, I can't imagine that anybody goes like, oh, I'm interested in seeing this movie now after this trailer. It's just got to be like, what the hell is that? And it was. I liked it. If you recall, I actually edited that for you. So uh, oh, I right. believe that uh, I was in. I was. Uh, well, why didn't you say to me, Sam? This is interesting and it's it's good if you've seen the movie and maybe you've seen Pilot Seas in the sequel, but but that's not the point of this. The point is to get people to, to watch it. And I was doing it as if like they had watched the movie 
and watch right. the it was sequel. for the fans it was for the fans because they just wanted to know that they could buy it again yeah i, I mean i made the the trailer for for only for the maybe 100 people who had ever seen the movie so you and go they really appreciated it I, I don't know that that's the case either i never heard from anybody i never heard anybody say anything about that trailer except well, for, i can tell you right now i liked it <laughs> thank you uh, but Who's the Caboose is available on, I think it's iTunes. And, and now it's also dated the, uh, the, the trailer because I, my character refers to it as iTunes uh, without, I, I do, yeah. or something to that effect. I don't know. Cause yeah, yeah but you did, you did it on purpose. And yeah. Yes. Were, that was, was me. That was me, you know, playing up the boomer before people even knew what it was. <laughs> yeah. Now it would st strain credulity to think that even anyone, like even as dumb as you would not know how to pronounce iTunes. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, Matthew Film Guy, uh, the movies that you have uh, recommended, I will uh, reiterate, are Panic in the Streets, Going in Style, Hirokazu Okaida's Afterlife, and What Do You Say to a Naked Lady, and Fat City. We will put all of those uh, in the, uh, the descriptions of today's show. Uh, Matthew, um, you know, I don't know how long this is going to go on, but we're going to be leaning on you, I think, heavily. I mean, I, I don't know. We may end up doing this segment on a Wednesday. That sounds fine. I'm going to be doing my job here, consuming this media and trying to make sure that it's good enough to recommend to you and your audience, Sam. So you can call on me anytime. Thank you, buddy. I appreciate it. Bye-bye. Well, bye-bye. Matthew Film Guy, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, got a couple of uh, clips we're going to go through here. Um, I don't think we're going to get to any uh, phone calls or IMs today. I haven't been able to set up my IM thing. I don't know why either, but uh, we, we will... You know, this weekend, uh, uh, part of it will be spent doing that. I may even try and take a walk and get away from my kids for, I don't know, seven minutes if they let me. That would be good. Um, here is Donald Trump. It's clip number three. Donald Trump, um, he is playing, you know, he's got a both try and spread the word that this whole call for ventilators is completely overblown. And also he is worried. He, you know, I don't know if that we actually played the specific video. It was one that was like the one with the calendar, which showed the progression of him denying that this is going to be an issue, downplaying it as an issue, ignoring it as an issue and then starting to come around that maybe it's an issue and then saying that this is really uh, difficult. He is, they, they, they made a video, they've been putting it out. They are, uh, they're advertising this and he's suing to try and get the, uh, the, the ad from going on air, which is absurd. It's, it's literally just his words and the dates that he said them. So now he is, trying to retroactively make it clear that people understand that he is not responsible for the failure of our government and himself to take this seriously. Clip number three. Guys? Oh, here we go. This was something that nobody has ever thought could happen to this country. I'm not even blaming. Look, we inherited a broken situation, but I don't totally blame the people that were before me and this administration. Nobody would have ever thought a thing like this could have happened. But uh, the Production Act, Defense Production Act, uh, is a wonderful thing, but I just haven't had to use it. They know it's activated. They know I can use it. Maybe that frightens them a little bit. You know, it's got tremendous power, but I haven't had to. Please. All right. I just want to be clear that they literally got rid of the head of pandemic response in this country, whose title I think was head of pandemic response or something to that effect, who sat on the National Security Council. They got rid of the person who monitors pandemics in China from the CDC. I think their title was something like pandemic monitor of China. The idea that people did not anticipate that a pandemic could happen is a lie. And the idea that his pandemic response was in shambles is a function of what he did. There's literally a pandemic handbook that they ignored that was put out by that 
the head of pandemic response, that he got rid of that position. Now, unfortunately, like, I don't know, 70, 80, 100,000 people may hear me say that, but that's irrelevant. We need some national leaders to come up and say, uh, you know, just incidentally about that thing you said before, wrong. Right, and then they ultimately got rid of two-thirds of the CDC staff in China. What do you think they were doing there? They were looking at epidemics, aware of the fact that it could be a pandemic. I mean, this is, that's a total lie. It's a total lie, and unfortunately, we don't have somebody who can step up to the microphone and say, I watched the conference today. And that's a lie. I mean, frankly, that's what Joe Biden should be doing. Roll tape. There's Donald Trump. Pause it. He, he, can, he can take it from me. I will, I, I will give him a free license to take pause it. Pause it. Donald Trump is lying. Continue. I mean, that's it. Well, I don't know if this is exactly what you're talking about, but Bernie Sanders did assign blame several times during his live stream the other day that he did with uh, various public health officials, doctors, as well as Pramila Jayapal. It was really cute, actually. He kept saying, I don't mean to be political, but then he assigns blame to Donald Trump for policies that are killing people. And that is a good thing. That's the kind of leadership that we need. Absolutely. Um... I mean, and, you know, uh, I, I think th that is the best argument for him to stay in the primary, it seems to me, uh, less about, uh, because I don't, you know, I, I mean, obviously it's not impossible, but I think uh, the odds are, uh, he himself said it's an extremely steep climb, and I would say, yes, that is, uh, that's almost an understatement. But the value of him staying in the campaign is that very thing. And frankly, there should be more uh, Democrats coming out and doing that. But really, the most obvious person to do it at that point after Bernie is Biden. And after Biden, it would be Schumer and Pelosi. And I just don't know that they're up to the task. Here is uh, Donald Trump. And this, you know, this is, um, this is the best best argument one could make for the failure of our health insurance system. It is that when we need it the most, it is going to be there the least. We will have, I, like I say, speculation on my part, but by this time next week, I mean, gosh, uh, by this time next week, I think the reality will be that we will have, you know, over 10 million jobless claims could be more by this time next week because remember on wednesday i think of it next week we're going to hear about the jobless claims from this week we heard this week the claims from last week last week it was three million this is the week where we're going to see people who are um you know where we have that all these more uh, stay-at-home orders Next week, we're going to get more. And so uh, the reporting will probably be, I think, you know, close to 9 million, maybe 7 million, maybe 8, 9 million people out of work. But the reality will be actually there's a couple million more than that. And what kind of health care are they going to get? There's going to be, you know, there's this, this, this like mishmash of different opportunities, you know, some like incredibly expensive COBRA coverage, prohibitively expensive. Some can go into the ACA, but it's just going to be a mess. It's going to be a mess. And just imagine for a moment, what if all these people already had health care? What yeah, if the fact people... that they lost their jobs meant nothing in terms of their ability to access care? I mean, this is, this is not rocket science. So obvious. And, and every other country that has dealt with this problem they don't have to deal with that. Like, like multiple things are just taken right off the board. They, they start from day one with a foundation that actually is like, you know, providing the bare essentials to people. And we don't have that. So we are basically like, 
you know, this isn't just like, you know, the, the top floor of the building has been knocked off. There's no foundation. There's no foundation. It's, it's a mess. I don't know, Sam. I heard that people like the health care that's tied to their jobs and they like having it tied to their jobs and any efforts to change it is balderdash. Uh, I, I mean, at the very least, we now know that, you know, when they go around and go like, you can't take 160 million people off of their private uh, employer based health care. Well, that number has shifted dramatically. We just, you know, 10 percent less now, I think. Here is Donald Trump talking about how many people, I, well, listen to what Donald Trump says. And you tell me if you feel confident in what he's saying here. Oh, audio. Where's Donald Trump trying try to explain? Like, you know, like somebody said, well, what are we going to do about health care? Yeah. Millions of Americans out of work. Some of them will be losing their insurance. What's your plan to make sure, through no fault of your own, as you just mentioned, yeah. that they stay insured? Are you willing to plus up the subsidies for some of the exchanges under Obamacare, expand yeah. Medicaid? What's being considered? So, well, I mean, the things I just read to you are being considered, and other things are being considered. Uh, people are going to be getting uh, big checks, and it's it's not their fault. What happened to them is not their fault. Their so we're doing we're doing a lot of different things on health insurance. We have meetings on it today. We're taking care of our people. This is not their fault, what happened, and we're taking care. We're starting off by sending them very big checks. I think for a family of four, it's about $3,000. And uh, we're taking care of our people. We're taking care of our workers. Uh, this was not, you know, as I say, this was not a financial crisis. This was a health crisis, a medical crisis. We're going to take care of our people. Please. Yeah. Okay. You, uh, you got a, th a check for $3,000 of your family for, right? You've lost your job. Rent is coming due. Uh, how much is your health insurance going to cost? 3000 You know, it, it, you know, at this point, like, I don't know, for family four, maybe 1600 bucks a month. If it's Cobra, it's probably more. I mean, this, that, that is not sufficient. I'm sorry. That is not sufficient. And to the extent that it is, it's going to buy you one month. You're going to get one month. I mean, this is just, it's insanity. It's insanity that we have to address. How do you get healthcare in the middle of a pandemic? It's sheer insanity, and um, it, it's going to be completely ignored, right? I mean, like that, it's going to be completely ignored. If you like your plan, you can't necessarily keep it. There you go. Exactly. Can't necessarily keep it. Um, here's Kevin McCarthy with his lie about what we're going to do about health insurance for the, and, it, and, and I'm telling you, this time next week, we're going to be saying 10 million people have lost their jobs, but the number is actually going to be higher because we won't have counted the people who next week will have lost their jobs. Here's Kevin McCarthy arguing that like, oh, this, this will all be fine. People will get their health insurance. He doesn't care. He's going to get his. Here it is. Clip number six. The employees who lose their health care. What, what, I mean, are there going to be more money for Obamacare, Medicare? I mean, what, what are they going to do? Well, you know what the most important is for them not to not to lose their job. And that's what this bill does. If you are a small business, meaning if you have fewer than 500 employees, we are going to provide you the money, not a loan, but a grant to pay your rent and pay your employees. You keep 100 percent of them. You know what? We pay 100 percent of that salary. That allows for the next two months that we get through this. Just as you talk about date certain, we will get through this, but we'll keep you employed so you won't worry about health insurance yeah, the, the, because the, it's the, being paid. Yeah. Jamie, let's 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 re uh, reenact this, okay? You be Laura Ingram. You ask me uh, how are you going to uh, pay for the um, the millions of people who have been lost their jobs and have lost lost their health insurance. Uh, how are you going to pay for the millions of people who have lost their jobs and lost their health insurance? I'm pretending that I care about that. Well, uh, let me pretend like I didn't hear your question, and I will answer the thing that we're going to try and stop people from losing their jobs. So we're going to pretend that uh, three to 10 million people haven't lost their jobs. And by doing that, we're going to be able to pivot to the question of what we're doing to help keep people keeping their jobs 
So uh, when we start getting into the uh, 15 and 20 million people who have lost their jobs, we still won't have an answer for the original question you've asked for, but I will be able to come back on the program and say, it could have been 30. It could have been 30. And so we are very lucky in that respect. So thank you for the question. Can we move on to something else, like how the Democrats are politicizing this? Yeah, I'm satisfied with that answer. Um, next up, here's why immigrants are dirty country ruiners who should all be put in camps. There you go. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, you will be no, you'll be seeing both of us on Fox News um, within days. I'm, I'm, I'm miss, mix, missing up the audio, so I'm going to stop talking. Well, who are you? Are you eat Joe Biden? Just Joe Biden us? I, I, don't, I, don't, I was going to say, I was going to say, I, this is about keeping bosses in control of whether their workers have shelter and health care. Uh, of that, course. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's been the whole, that's been the whole, that's been the whole game plan. Throughout. I mean, it's, it's never been so naked. When Rick Scott got up on that uh, um, podium the other day and said like, if we pay people, we make them whole. If we make nurses whole to not work, they won't want to come into work. Yeah. It, right? it, like, wait a second. That's, that's, not, that's not what want means. That's not what want means. They're currently disease vectors. They shouldn't come into work if they can help what, it. Whatever. What you mean is they won't need to come into work if they want to eat and feed their kids. That's not what want means. It's never been more clear that this is not about the money, right? Like we've got trillions of dollars to build up, to bail out the cruise industry, the candy industry, uh, whatever you want to, whatever's corporate. But when it comes to providing healthcare, like it's the principle of the thing. Like if, if it costs them more money somehow to preserve uh, bosses. Control of labor. Of labor. Yep. They, they would. And like, there's plenty of evidence that it is actually cheaper to have a single payer system. I, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, you know, for years uh, prior to 2008, we would hear like every, every car that comes off the line of GM, like $2,300 is, is because of healthcare. Well, then why aren't they trying to get rid of the, that as a responsibility? And I think it, it, it all comes down to uh, the fact that it is, worth more than $2,300 per person who's working for them in terms of the control they have over that labor. And that's it. That's the bottom line. Um, so we talked earlier about Donald Trump trying to escape like, you know, the uh, responsibility for this by saying, like, you know, no one anticipated that a pandemic even existed. It was a, it was a failure of the imagination is what we were told in the uh, run up uh, to or the wake of 9-11, it's a failure of imagination, even though, in fact, um, Condi Rice was uh, kept off, uh, off a ship in the Mediterranean from going to a, uh, I think it was a G8 summit in Genoa, because they thought that there was a chance that airplanes were going to be flown into the summit. But the idea that uh, people didn't know about a pandemic, we know that the government was prepared at the very least or had other mechanisms in which to coordinate efforts to fight a pandemic, to deal with it, to see one coming, et cetera, et cetera. The Trump administration got rid of all that under the auspices of uh, the National Security Council with the help of John Bolton. I mean, this is a Republican project. This is a conservative project. This is not just a Trump thing. Here's Steve Bannon back in 2017 being interviewed, I believe, by Reince Prabus, who was the former chair of the RNC, was the former chief of staff to Donald Trump, brought in all the other Republicans. He's from the Republican establishment. Nobody says to Steve Bannon, wait, what? You want to get rid of the administrative state? But what if like, we get a, I don't know, have some need for it? Here is that clip number nine. Stephen Miller, these people that are rethinking how we're going to re reconstruct the back, uh, our trade back, arrangements around the world. I want to hear about how yeah. Stephen Miller. I, I, I think that I think the same thing. I think if you look at the lines of work, I, I kind of break it out into three verticals or three buckets. The first is kind of national security and sovereignty, and that's your intelligence, the Defense right. Department, Homeland Security. The second line of work is what I refer to as economic nationalism, and that is uh, Wilbur Ross at Commerce, Steve Mnuchin at Treasury, Lighthizer at uh, at Trade, uh, Peter Navarro, Stephen Miller. These people that are rethinking how we're going to re reconstruct the uh, our trade arrangements.
around the world. The third, broadly, line of work is what is deconstruction of the administrative state. And if you... So I think, I think, I think the three most important things, I think one of the most pivotal uh, moments in modern American history was his immediate withdrawal from TPP. That got us out of a, got us out of a trade deal and let our sovereignty come back to ourselves. The people, the mainstream media don't get this, but we're already working in consultation with the Hill. People are starting to think through a whole raft of amazing and innovative bilateral relationships, bilateral trading relationships with people that will reposition America in the world as a, as a fair trading nation and start to bring jobs, high value added manufacturing jobs back to the United States of America. On the, on, the, uh, on the national security part, it was certainly the first, I think the first two EOs that you've started to see implemented here over the last couple of days under General Kelly, and that is. I'll let it go, does he, is he, is he say more The about rule it? of law is going to exist when you talk about our sovereignty and you talk about immigration. Oh, General okay. Kelly and Attorney General uh, he Sessions. Doesn't get, he doesn't get to, he doesn't get, okay. Well, I mean, let's just stop with there with the uh, administrative state. What, what, what do you think the administrative state means? The administrative state means things like CDC. The administrative state means things like FDA. The administrative state means, the, you know, things like the EPA. It means things to protect our citizens, things to protect our environment. You couldn't get a better example of what the administrative state is than a guy who sits on the National Security Council and has a, a, a team of people who are to coordinate the response to a pandemic in this country. It's pure bureaucracy, pure bureaucracy. Their job is to coordinate the various agencies in what they're doing, making sure they're addressing it and sounding the alarm. That's exact. I mean, you couldn't get more of a bureaucracy if you wanted it. You couldn't get more of an administrative state if you wanted it. And they did it. They said they were going to do it, and they did it. They eliminated it. Unnecessary. Unnecessary until it's not unnecessary. Yeah, and it kind of puts the lie to his goal of helping American workers, right? Because, you know, white people can get the virus too. And the CDC is, yeah, because, you know, he, he means white workers when he says American workers. Um, but you need a CDC in order to protect those people. So, well, I mean, the bottom line is they just think that you don't need government, that you don't need a, a state to function and provide for people because the market will do it. And, and there is no doubt in my mind that the reason why the United States did not use the World Health Organization uh, test kits is because they wanted somebody in the administration, some lobbyist, they wanted that cash. They wanted to monetize it. That's what's going on here. The response on the, uh, on the, on the testing side, the response on the vaccination side, it's all about there's some cash to be made here and we're not going to let that opportunity go to waste. We're not going to use the light. We're not going to license it from uh, from the international community. We don't care how many days that saves, weeks that saves, months that saves. There's money to be made. That's the market. It's contrary to uh, you know. We're not going to the administrative state. Forget it. I mean, mission accomplished. They told everybody we were going to do it, and all those people applauding. In fact, it was the one of the biggest applause they got right at CPAC. All Republicans sitting there, destroy the administrative state. They got it. And they're about to, I think, get a taste of what it, what it's going to, what it's going to mean. Well, it means basically instead of hearing. Did Matt from- Walsh do this? Did, did Matt Walsh do this? Is this, is this clip that we have here? Number seven, is this recent? Please tell me this is from like a month ago before the guy decided to do any reading about it. It's from last night? You're kidding. I thought this was... Here's Matt Walsh coming up with a take that was in favor three weeks ago, four weeks ago by the right, that there's no difference between COVID-19 and, never mind the flu, even car accidents. 
was this guy on vacation? Or did he just, did someone at, at Daily Wire say like, hey, if we put this out on YouTube, it'll get, um, these are good search terms. There has to be a reason for this stupidity. Let's, um, let's see what uh, Matt Walsh says. Every year that we allow people to drive their cars, 30 to 35,000 people will die. And across the world, it would be a million people or thereabouts. And there will be tens of thousands more if not hundreds of thousands more, I don't know, who are, who are seriously injured, maimed, maimed, or crippled in car accidents. We know that is the cost of having our cars. And yet, nobody says, let's get rid of cars. And so what we are, the calculation we have made, the bargain we have made, the deal we've made is um, those 35,000 dead are a price worth paying so that we can drive. We don't want to put it that way. We don't want to think of it that way. We're not saying that it would be worth it to actively kill 35,000 people to like appease the gods or something so that we can drive. That's not the point. Okay. We're not, we're not saying that we should go out and kill 35,000 people ourselves in order to drive. What we're saying is if people drive, 35,000 people or thereabouts will die. We don't want them to, but they will. And Although we're very sad about that, we will accept that side effect. And then we bring that over to the COVID-19 discussion and we say, okay, um, in order to preserve our economy, we know what we're willing to accept in order to preserve our ability to drive. What are we willing to accept in terms of a death toll in order to preserve our economy and our way of life and our livelihoods? Our cars, along with our homes and our retirement savings and the food in our fridge and everything else, what are we willing to accept there in terms of risk, in terms of potential death toll? It's got to be way over 35,000. So what is it? I don't know. I'm just saying that's the point. That's the ethical question that we're dealing with. This guy, I mean, put aside the ghoulishness of what he's saying. That's fine, because I understand. I don't want facts to get in the way of, uh, I don't want emotions to get away in the facts. But is there a better example of someone being more ignorant? Like literally the first year words out of his mouth in this clip is every year, 30 to 35,000 people die in car accidents. Every year. We know this. And, and somehow this guy is so dim he doesn't realize that he has answered his own question we also know that the flu in this country will take the lives of anywhere from like 28,000 to maybe up to 60,000 in any given year we know this the problem with COVID-19 is we don't know we don't know how many thousands will die we don't know how long this will last. We don't know any of this. We have no way of knowing. It is got a death rate that is higher than the flu. It is significantly more contagious, so it can overwhelm our hospitals, right? Like, so right now in New York, what is the death rate? How many people have we had died in New York? Almost a thousand, is it now? At one point, we're going to cross the threshold where the hospitals cannot handle the number of, of people who are severely ill. And the death rate is going to go even, is going to grow exponentially at that point. We don't know this. We're not set up to this. We're set up where we know how many people are going to die every year on the roads. And we can make that determination. When you're talking about a pandemic, when you're talking about a virus that is this virulent and this contagious, we don't know the answer to it. We don't know what the number is, and that's the whole point why you do this. If there was, you know, the, if the virus gods, as he says, because he loves to came down and said, hey, uh, only uh, 
1,500 people are going to die in the country from this. Well, guess what? It would be just like the flu. It'd be better than the flu. But we don't know. That's the whole point. That's the whole point. And he kept reiterating, we know this. Well, yes, that's the whole point, you moron. It's unbelievable. The, the, the mental masturbation that is involved and that guy going out there thinking he's saying something profound and it's really a question of like, I'm going to isolate for everybody what the ethical question is. We have 519 total deaths in New York at this point. And we are on the, we are on the cusp of this thing really hitting in New York City. Also, and, 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 go ahead. Also, it's just kind of a fatuous comparison, right? Like, I think most people can see the inherent use value in being able to travel around in cars. Uh, and we probably would keep vehicles around uh, in a, even a, a socialistic society. Whereas sacrificing people's lives for an imaginary line at a time when it's becoming more and more clear to people that the economy is pretend, uh, it's going to land less well. Well, I mean, absolutely. I mean, look, some of it's real, right? I mean, uh, but, but that's because people are afraid and they have a real fear. And the fear is founded in the fact that we don't know how, how we don't know how many people are going to die from this. We don't know how, um, how many people are going to get severely ill from this. I mean, it's, you know, we, we have the death rate of, of 519 at this point in New York, but there's far more people who are in ICU who it may take them three or four months to recover. I mean, that's serious stuff. And um, so it's not like, but the amazing thing is just like to watch someone who thinks that they're being so, uh, you know, both like sort of like this guy thinks that he's, you know, he's Spock on Star Trek. I have the ability to look at this without emotion. And I'm just going to break it down with you with pure logic, except for the, the premise of my entire treaties is exactly the one reason why everything I'm saying is complete bunk. It's fascinating to watch someone. The, the, the intersection of self-confidence and inability to reason well with that guy, I think is like, is legendary. I mean, like if there was a, if there was a hall of fame for people uh, whose estimation of themselves and their abilities were at such odds, I think he would be, uh, you know, one of the first inductees into that hall of fame. So oh, yeah. he's got that going for him. There's nothing worse than a know-it-all nerd who's not actually smart. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, here is a finally, we'll just end it with this. Uh, Dennis Prager must have seen that like um, uh, Glenn Beck got some uh, traction and uh, others got some traction by saying like, hey, we don't need to quarantine. We need to get the uh, economy going. I mean, this is basically um, more uh, of like this sort of Matt Walsh brain, but this guy actually is a dean or president of a whole university, Prager University. Here he is. And you know he's a president of a university because he's telling us this from a study. That is why I was worried about the, the original idea of confinement and shutting down the whole economy. It may turn out to be wise. Thus far, I'm not fully convinced, but I'm doing it because uh, I'm a good citizen, and that is the uh, we get we're going to give it a try, but not interminably. We cannot wreck the the livelihoods of tens of millions of people in our country, my country, in your country, uh, unless the numbers are so frighteningly great, uh, surpassing flu numbers in death. Remember. In, in America alone, 30 to 50,000 la last year, last season, this season, since fall of last year, have died from the influenza. Imagine if the networks kept uh, up a, uh, 
a chart with flu deaths every year? Why don't they do that? Well, first off, I would say they probably should. It would convince more people to get their uh, flu uh, vaccination. But aside from that, again, these people are so ridiculous. They're idiots. You can't say to the virus, hey, you know what? You've gone 55,000 deaths. We're going to stop doing the other things that we were doing that are causing those deaths. These morons don't understand that you don't have control over this. That we know that scientists have said it is far more contagious. It is far more virulent. It has a higher uh, death rate than the flu. And you can't say, well, and now that you've surpassed 35,000 deaths, we're going to basically time out. You don't say that to a virus. And, and I think we're about to find that out in this country. That because Donald Trump did not take it seriously for the first six to eight weeks when he could have, that our attempts to mitigate it after the fact are going to be why we have the most deaths of any other country, perhaps in the world. You know, I, I don't trust the Chinese uh, numbers. It's an autocratic country. They're, 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 they have a lot of interest in, in, in keeping those numbers um, down, at least in terms of what they report. But we are too late to this. And in an ongoing fashion, there's whole swaths of the country that look at, uh, you know, the president of Prager University and say, well, he must be, I mean, he's a president of his own university. He must know what he's talking about. This can't be that bad. But uh, these are all things that we will talk about when we return next week. Jamie, stay safe. Will do. Matt, Brendan, stay safe. Everyone uh, out there, stay safe over the weekend. Check out uh, Literary Hangover. Check out uh, The Antifada. Check out TMBS. Check out uh, The No McKee Show. Uh, support this program if you can. If you cannot, send us an email at majorityreporters at gmail.com. We'll uh, hook you up. And uh, I promise you on Monday, our, our tech is gonna, gonna be better. And then every day after that is gonna get just a little bit more better. We'll see. All right, folks, have a good one. I got to get to where I want, but I know somehow I'm gonna get there. I wasn't looking when I just got caught. See the truth in the light bar Finding out won't make me feel any better Yeah, I know the clock is ticking But the meds are gonna kick in And my pilot light shining bright I get somewhere